People have fasted pretty much for the entire time of recorded history, and for the most part, every culture on the planet does it. For example, the Islamic nations fast during the period of Ramadan, the Hindus of India during Purnima, and Christians of both Catholic and Protestant faiths do so during Lent. There are even some species of animals that fast from time to time. Now, within the keto and the ketovore community, intermittent fasting is part and parcel to the lifestyle. But the question is, what about those who are 99% or even full-blown carnivore? Should they do so? Are there any benefits? Stick around and find out. Hey friends, Alan Davis here. Uh, wanting to uh, let you know that learning about fasting was really what saved my health when I switched to a ketogenic lifestyle about three years ago. Now, before I really get too far into this talk, I want to clear up something right from the get-go. True fasting begins at the 72-hour point. Everything else that's up to that, we call it intermittent fasting, but it's really time-restricted feeding. But for the sake of simplicity, I'll just refer to any of those periods less than 72 hours as fasting. So, Professor K, if somehow or another you stumble across this video, please do not excoriate me uh, to the public at large, okay? Now, the question I often get is, how often should one fast? Well, frankly, it depends on the state of health. Simply put, the more destructive the past, the longer the fast. And whether you're on keto, ketovore, or carnivore, fasting can benefit you depending upon your health goals. So in the next several minutes, I'm going to examine some ideas relating to fasting. I'll draw some conclusions afterward and help make it practical for each one of us individually. First, let's talk about what it means for the body to be properly fed. Now, very few of us in the Western world are deficient in this regard. We might not be eating all the correct types of food, but generally we are well fed in all, for all intents and purposes. The body is generally in an anabolic state. That is, when we have a sound diet, the bones will make good blood, and in turn, the blood will provide good nutrition and oxygen to the cells that need it. Our food must hail from good sources, which will produce the correct intake and discharge of energy for optimal health. We must be consuming macronutrients of proteins and fats, and if so desired, carbohydrates, because remember, there are no essential carbohydrates. And all of these need to be within the proper ratios from ideal sources. Now, I'll be straightforward with you. My diet breaks down to about 70% fat, 25% protein, and 5% carbohydrate. Now, that is not a daily schema, but rather, you know, some weeks, not a carb one. Other weeks, I might have a little bit more in the form of bread. And this allows my body, regardless, to burn as its fuel predominantly fat. And at the same time, I have achieved a level of metabolic flexibility such that I can switch back and forth between carbs, protein, fat, and not lose the level of health that I've achieved. Now, let's dive into this concept of fasting. Bottom line is fasting is starvation, bar none. But because it's intentional, we simply call it fasting. It's a form of physical therapy and healing. And note, because it's physical, it'll also result in therapeutic mental and spiritual well-being. All right, and you gotta keep that in mind. Remember the last video that I did. Now, during the time of fasting, the body is in a catabolic state, at least for a little while. Depending upon the duration of the fasting, glycogen stores are converted into glucose and are typically exhausted within about a 24-hour period. And I'm going to break it down to basically look at what happens at 18 hours and what happens at 24 hours. After that, fat becomes the primary fuel for the body. And once the body gets into fat burning mode, the liver produces ketones, which form essentially a cleaner burning fuel than glucose, kind of like diesel versus gasoline. And these ketones can fuel all the body's energy's requirements. In those instances when glucose is needed, for example, for parts of the brain, eyes, and the kidneys, the body will enter into a process we all understand as gluconeogenesis by tapping first fat and, if needed, protein stores, converting it into the required glucose. Now, as the fasting process is prolonged, mTOR, that is mammalian target of rapamycin, it's a protein, is reduced, and as a result, the process of autophagy begins. On the flip side, it's stimulated by glucose and amino acids for when the body is in need of growth. 
Autophagy is the process of cells recycling their waste and rejuvenating both individual cells and organelles within those cells. I'll cover more on that a little bit later. Along with autophagy, the production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, begins. Further, as the body enters into a state of autophagy, human growth hormone, HGH, is produced, which helps to inhibit the aging process. In some respects, it actually reverses. So in other words, the cells get younger because the telomeres within the chromosomes are kept at a good length or are even lengthened, and you get to live longer. And as a result, you experience both prosperity and health. Now, as a side note, it's beneficial to exercise while you're fasting, depending upon the duration. For example, if you're doing a 48 to 72 hour fast, you can pretty much keep your routine. For example, if you're doing strength training, keep doing some lifting. However, you might find that if you're 50 some odd hours into a fast and you're getting under a heavy bar for a squat, you might not finish that last repetition or that last set. But don't let that dissuade you, keep moving forward. If, however, you are doing a prolonged fast, an actual fast, for example, a five or a seven day, then limit your exercise to walking only. You don't need to deplete yourself any further. Uh, you might even consider doing some stretching if the uh, walking is even too much. It's at this point, uh, human growth hormone can be increased uh, by upwards of 2,000%, especially if you're doing high, in high intensity interval training. And again, just to be certain, I and clear, I'm talking about within the up to and including that 72 hour window. Now, I'm going to briefly look at what happens after 18 hours of fasting. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, I can't fast for 18 hours. How is that possible? Well, let's think about it. If you eat your final meal of the day at six o'clock and you get up the next morning about six after going to bed at maybe 10 and you delay your meal till noon, well, there's 18 hours. And basically what you've done is you've prepared a pathway for your body to become more metabolically flexible, in turn, more insulin sensitive. And that's really the direction we wanna go. We want metabolic health. Now, as I mentioned, glycogen stores are beginning to be depleted. Now, up to 24 hours, we talked about that, but at 18, they're beginning to be depleted and the body shifts gears into a fat burning mode. There's a little bit of each the ketone production in the liver will increase and these ketones now become measurable via breath, urine, or blood. So you can test these and blood's probably the easiest one. You can just get one of those uh, Keto Mojo monitors if you are so inclined to do so. I used one of those for a few years just to kind of monitor if I was or was not in a state of ketosis. And one thing that I that just came to mind, and that is if you are staying in ketosis for prolonged periods of time, you want to make sure that you come out of that every now and then, preferably once a day, by eating a good bolus of food uh, with good protein in it, all right? Because the fat's not really going to stimulate anything, and you don't necessarily want carbohydrates to do it, but allow the protein to make that happen. As I mentioned a few moments ago, the body begins to produce BDNF at a much higher rate, which results in the brain both repairing and building new cells and synapses. For years, we've been sold a bill of goods telling us that once brain cells are dead, that's it, they're not gonna come back. But this new science is telling us otherwise. We've also been told that the brain only uses glucose for fuel, but clearly that's nonsense. Ketones are a better fuel. Yes, the brain needs some glucose, from time to time, but again, the body will make exactly what it needs. We need to understand, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Despite the effects of our decaying world, we have been provided a means internally, physiologically, whereby to affect health and regeneration. Now, at this point, within 18 hours, human growth hormone increases dramatically, which contributes to reparation at the DNA level. Think about it. Aging is a disease. We have to get older chronologically, but we don't have to age, at least not according to society's expectations. In fact, new stem cells can be made and actually keep your body at a physiological age of 30 even though chronologically you might be 50. 
And it's all about allowing the body to do what it does well as you approach this thing we call autophagy. So let's talk about what happens at 24 hours. Now, autophagy at this point is at about 80%, and it's in the process of getting rid of the old material and recycling so other processes, such as apoptosis via the FOXO3 protein, can go to work and regenerate the body. Now, some might say, you know, autophagy is somewhat theoretical and we don't know a whole lot about it. That's true. But we do know that fasting does promote healing in certain patients who are suffering certain chronic, chronic illnesses. So to dismiss it altogether would be reckless, I think. But is more study required? Absolutely. And the more that we dig into it, the more we know. It's important to note the body is programmed, that is, it's designed to go into self-repair mode after a period of not consuming any food. And just so happens, it begins around the 18-hour mark, 24, it almost goes in full scale. Um, and it's based on the fact that the body is designed to both feast and fast. All, right? All these meals that so many people eat throughout the day actually burdens the body and puts it in a, in a very feverish state. And so we want to avoid that. At 24 hours, as I mentioned already, ketones become the main fuel, giving energy to all the body's physical functions. Typically, the glycogen stores are depleted at this particular point. And again, glucose, if needed, will be brought about by a process of gluconeogenesis. Where human growth hormone and brain-derived neurotrophic factor were increasing pretty rapidly, they've now accelerated to an exponential rate. And the body is now on a healing path all natural. That's the best part. Insulin sensitivity begins to increase, which in turn permits the proper use and the storage of glucose. And this is all part of the Randall cycle. We need to understand that. And, you know, we haven't talked much about that, if at all, on this channel, but I think I might do a Randall cycle for dummies. I think it's appropriate. This process of fasting, intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating, call it what you will, can be done daily either at the 18 level or even 24 hour protocol. Um, but here's the thing, if you start moving down this pathway, realize you're not gonna see immediate results. You might feel a little bit better after a couple of three days, perhaps after going through what they call the keto flu, a little bit of withdrawal. But remember, it's gonna take a couple of three weeks before you actually start seeing the results you're hoping for. If you see it sooner, great, but typically two to three weeks. So to that end, it's imperative to eat at most twice a day, preferably within a four to six hour window. One meal a day is optimal for best results from time-restricted eating. And clearly fasting is critical to good health and wellness. Fasting promotes healing, weight loss, the autophagy that we talked about, production of new brain cells, increased human growth hormone, genetic expression, stem cell production, and the repairing of DNA down at the mitochondria level. That's just absolutely amazing. And every now and then, it's not a bad idea to do a 36 to 48 hour abstention from food, perhaps once every third week, whatever you need to do to make yourself feel better. Upwards of twice a year, if your body needs it, a five to seven day fast might be in order. Again, how much damage has been done to your body over the years? And so the more that we can put it in a repair mode, the better it is. We've got to be careful not to go too long on that because we really don't want to break down muscle tissue and actually get in a catabolic state in that regard. But there are some studies that show that if you do one seven-day fast, just in your lifetime, one seven-day fast, that the likelihood of you contracting cancer is reduced by over 70%. Now, I think those are pretty good odds. Now, of course, it's not a random clinical trial. It's epidemiological. Nevertheless, it is something upon which we can dig a little more deeply. But here's the bottom line. For fasting to be optimal, one must eliminate all the refined and processed sugar from the diet. You must dispense with all the seed oils. Get rid of the pulverized grains and definitely no processed foods in the diet. 
As for other carbohydrates, if you're overweight and struggling with prediabetes or actual two, type 2 diabetes itself, then I would suggest eliminating all carbohydrates until such time your health and weight are back to a healthy level. So, all that said, for, folks, what do you think? Do you do time-restricted eating? What about those of you on a carnivore diet? Have you experienced any health benefits by doing it since you've been on a 99% or greater carnivore diet? I really would be interested in hearing your thoughts, so please share them down in the comment section below. Now, before you go, please like this video, share it. There are people out there who need this information, and your liking and your sharing will help this matter. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this channel. And until next time, this is Dr. Alan Davis wishing above all things that you might be in health, that you might prosper, and that you might have abundant life more than you could ever hope or think. Take care and be strong.